Mr. Chair, Shannon is now in the meeting. Thanks. And the meeting is also live now. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tony Mancini, I'm the chair of the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee, and I welcome you to our meeting. It is September the 2nd, and it's about uh, four minutes after one. Uh, let's uh, call this meeting to order. And as we always do, I'd like to do a little roll call and make sure that we uh, have who we're supposed to have and uh, check their audio and their visual. So uh, from District 1, uh, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, colleagues and staff, and anybody else that's there. Lovely wet day. Yeah, lovely wet day. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. And uh, from beautiful downtown Dartmouth, uh, District 5, uh, Councillor Austin. I'm here, Mr. Chair, and all seems right. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and uh, we, get, we have regrets from Councillor Cleary from District 9, unfortunately. Uh, not a good day to find out he's got a leak in his roof. So he's scrambling right now uh, to uh, deal with that. So he sends uh, his regrets and uh, asks if all of us show up at his house later with buckets. That would be appreciated. So uh, Next, we have Councillor Morris in District 10. Good afternoon, everyone. Not bailing here so far and looking forward to the meeting. Very good. Thank you, Councillor. And the last but definitely not least, uh, Councillor Lovelace in District 13. Good afternoon, colleagues. Great to be here. I'm just watching the storm water as it falls into our wetlands and lakes. <laughs> Looking forward to a meeting, this great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we have lots of staff, so uh, I think we have, I believe we have all the staff that we need to address the agenda items, so we won't bother going to a roll call. So we'll go to number two on the agenda, which is the approval of the minutes from July the 7th. So are there any uh, deletions or changes needed for the, the minutes from July 7th? Seeing none, if we could have a motion of approval. I so move. So uh, moved by Catherine, Councilor Catherine Morris, uh, seconder. And Second. Councilor Austin. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed to that? So we now have approved minutes. Uh, next is number three, approval of order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? There is no proposed addition or deletion to the, today's agenda. Well, thank you. Uh, any committee members have any additions or deletions or modifications to the order of business? Seeing none, I call for uh, someone to move approval of our agenda. So moved. Uh, by uh, Catherine Neil Gammon, a seconder. Seconded, Lovelace. Councilor Lovelace, thank you. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. We now have an agenda. Fantastic. Uh, number four is business arising out of the minutes. Any business arising out of these minutes? Uh, seeing none, uh, then we call for any declaration of conflict of interest. And seeing none. Then we have motion of re reconsideration, motions of rescission, consideration of deferred business, and notice of table matters, all none. And then we come to correspondence. Uh, yeah, Madam Clerk, are there any uh, correspondence? Yes, there have been three pieces of correspondence received, and it has been circulated to the committee. Well, thank you, Aruka. Uh, are there any uh, petitions, colleagues? Seeing none, um, now we come to the time for presentations. We're fortunate to have two presentations today. Uh, the first one is a model uh, SCO alert, and we have uh, Kelly Schneer and uh, Orr Denemark. And uh, I believe it's gonna be, a, 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 we're gonna play an audio presentation by Kelly. And uh, Orr, are you on the line? And am I pronouncing your name properly? So I apologize I'm not. Yes. Hi, everyone. No, you're uh, you got it just right. It's or just like this or that. OK, well, or and or uh, where he is, uh, the sun is shining, the palm trees must be District 6 and should be parked uh, with that palm tree in behind. <laughs> mine's, mine's not as big as yours, or but that's OK. I'm OK with that. So uh, <laughs> so I believe that uh, we're going to play the um, uh, the audio presentation that uh, Kelly Schneer uh, has done. And then after that, uh, the committee has the opportunity to ask for any clarifying clarifying questions and or you're prepared to answer those, is that correct? 
Yes, that's correct. Good. So uh, if we could uh, run the video, uh, Aruka, that's great. And then uh, we'll look for questions at the end. Thank you. Just give me a moment, please. Krista, audio is not coming through, so please make sure you click the audio and could you please share the slides again? I will, my apologies. No worries. The ESSC for the Good afternoon and thank you to the ESSC for the opportunity to present on this important issue of combined sewer overflows and to the amazing model policy alert report I look forward to walking you through today. Thank you to lawyer Pippa Feinstein for the slide deck and to the incredible leadership from Swim Drink Fish represented here today by Or Denimark who's available for answering questions after the presentation. My name's Kelly Schneer. I'm Projects Director with Reimagining Atlanta Harbors, and we collect one story, one data point, one harbor at a time. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we all gather here today it is that of the Mi'kmaq First Nation, and from time immemorial, they've been and still are the stewards of the lands and waters in this area in Halifax. RAW 2050 has begun and is committed to fostering better relationships with Indigenous communities in order to continue the stewardship of the waters, which we all rely on. Next slide. The why today is about giving you really solid advice and a very clear blueprint as to how our community can open up more access to swimmable water in our community. To advance transparency and open data policy, I believe this is how we can make it happen. We know that public interest in water activities is driving these advancements, and CSOs include bacteria, pathogens, viruses, and parasites that aren't only harmful to humans, but to the vast amount of species that also use our waters. The alert system is to support the public's right to know about the health of their waterways, to support integrated management of these spaces, and to provide a tool and roadmap for how potentially simple this process can be. Next slide. This report was developed in 2019 with support from the Great Lakes Network. In consultation with EPA requirements, it was drafted for use in the Great Lakes and updates have enabled our shorelines and municipalities to do the same. Next slide. As municipalities are already required to collect and report overflows, here, the information is disclosed to the public, as well as other government agencies. These real-time alerts are a simple way we can make people aware of the scale of the problems we're facing. So ultimately then, that awareness can be mobilized to create support around sewage bypasses or any releases of raw sewage, which are exacerbating issues such as aging infrastructure and the climate crisis. Next slide. Several notable municipalities are already proactively reporting on CSO events. For example, Vancouver has a communications policy enacted last year reporting real-time sanitary overflows using an ArcGIS map on their website, where the province has agreed to end all CSO events by 2050. It's an example of understanding the scope of the problem we're facing. In Metro Vancouver, they received 755,000 cubic meters of wastewater into Falls Creek last year. This issue is a large one and it can be addressed. Next slide. The model CSO alert at a glance is only 11 pages, includes some amazing references, and it's a starting point for strategic action and ongoing negotiation 
with both advocates and authorities. Next slide. There are three clear sections that are notable in this 11 page report. Next slide. The introduction is an everyday language providing context for both legal and policy purposes with regards to bylaws. The alert was drafted to address reporting of releases of sewage upstream from wastewater facilities, example CSOs, pumping stations, collection systems, not wastewater treatment plant releases. Next slide. Section one of the template details clear signage requirements in the vicinity of both exposed and submerged outfalls. Further information requests are determined with ongoing public consultation, but it includes consistent messaging of the required information sharing and community engagement opportunities. The alert's meant to present a gold standard and contains more than the law currently requires, but not by much. And then communities can pick and choose what would be most useful to them, what data they want, and when they need it. Next slide. Here is a language template for outfall signage. And with lessons learned through RAW 2050's shoreline information panels, it's the more engaging, interactive, and integrated signage that's community-led from the beginning that has proven benefits. Next slide. Here's the content design for publicly planning accessible mapping. Ensuring that the map is both mobile friendly, comprehensive, and fully accessible is really essential for buy-in from the community and regular use from the public. It's built for the public. Next slide. Sections three to five concern public reporting, and the example implies the contents for what the real-time reporting looks like. It speaks to public concern, and it's more than just an online document that's never seen. It describes communication releases are immediate, comprehensive, documented, that the public has a space to reference, but also communications in radio, television, and social media. The content must be accessible and include location, duration, volume, cause, and affected water bodies and recreational spaces. Here's a communications template for a corporate press release. It describes what the public should be aware of while the event is occurring and protocols for avoiding harm. Next slide. After the event, contents of communication include the details of the event as available and further direction to more comprehensive monthly reporting. Next slide. Requirements of public notification to happen effectively describe in detail what members of the public do in the case of a CSO event. For example, not touching the affected receiving water bodies for 48 hours after the event. This is a standard communication piece in the Great Lakes region and strongly effective. Next slide. Monthly reports are required to be disclosed using publicly accessible language and machine readable data sets, including both water quality and quantity. Further information requirements can be determined through public consultation and periodic public review should always follow the adoption of new regulations and policies to make sure it's working as needed. Next slide. Clearly readable, publicly available tables such as these are valuable for supporting questions members of our community face during and after a CSO event. Clarity is really valuable open transparency as well, and it can happen when these monthly reports are current and are kept online and remain online. Next slide. While annual trend reports are already required by federal procedures, it's an evaluation opportunity that can connect and summarize developments from the municipality, from pollution prevention and control plans. Such disclosures 
require a permanent link online and printed copies that are available to the public. Next slide. So there's a willingness to come to the table. This is an indication that we're taking our CSO issue seriously. It's through the transparent pollution prevention planning that feedback mechanisms can have an opportunity for continual engagement with the public. Continuing to come to this table with our shared goals, these clear definitions and feedback mechanisms can allow us to move in a supportive direction together. Next slide. The model of ALERT does much of this policy bridging work for communities and municipalities. This work supports the public's right to know about the health of their local waterways so that they can make informed decisions about how they want to use those spaces for recreation. Next slide. Here are references available to learn more about this topic. There's presentations, reports, and comprehensive websites. I welcome you to use, next slide. Thank you for your time and attention today. Or Denmark from Swim Drink Fish is available for questions and we look forward to working with you further on this important issue locally. Well, thank you, uh, Kelly and Or. Thank you also uh, so for the presentation. Um, pollution prevention planning is extremely important uh, more so now than ever. Uh, uh, I look at the committee members. Anybody have any uh, questions or questions for clarification that Dora is uh, willing to uh, do his best to answer? Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, you have a question? The floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Kelly. Is is Kelly here in the meeting? No, unfortunately, she's not. So, um, uh, uh, so that's why I'm Yeah. Okay. Well, I, was, I, I had met with Kelly uh, previously about this uh, project, and so um, it was a pleasure to be able to hear her do it a second time. Um, I guess my question is, what are the impediments to this being in, in existence now as a, an alert mechanism within HRM? So, um, Sorry, so you, you mean what is the barriers? What is missing at the moment? Yes. Yeah, so at, at the moment, I think definitely the signage uh, would be the, the top priority. So um, again, the tool, of the, the, the thing that we're trying to create is we're trying to mobilize the community in a sense, right? We want to let them know what is happening with the water. Um, and that's what the model is all about. Is It's about alerting the public to an existing issue that's happening uh, with their waters. So I think that at the moment, uh, there are no clear signage um, next to every um, outfall. So uh, whether it's submerged or um, a kind of on land. So that would be the very first step. And then the second step would be uh, to create the online and real time uh, alerting system, uh, which again, the, the information is there. So, uh, you know, the, you will be you'll re, you're receiving uh, this information from the different uh, bodies if it's a water treatment plant or whatever body it is that's operating the pipe who's in charge of the pipe they they're mandated to report on how much uh, sewage is passing through the pipe they should they should have this information and the the next link in the chain would be to provide this information to the public in kind of an interactive way, uh, some, a way that most people will be able to understand and, uh, and hopefully also that is cell phone friendly uh, because that's what most people would be using. So, so I think that it, what's missing right now is kind of all of those uh, steps. Uh, you know, I, um, it, I, I wasn't, I don't know if that was clear or not, but uh, I live in Halifax as well. I'm, I'm calling you in from the North End and <laughs> so, uh, and I tried really hard to find even a simplest map of where are all the sewage, uh, you know, the, the combined sewers outfalls, where are they in on the peninsula? And, and it was very, very hard to track that down, uh, even like a, a static map, you know, not even an interactive one. So, so I think there is a lot of steps that could be implemented fairly easily and quickly uh, to get the, the public awareness up. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, may come back for another question later. I'll let my colleagues ask now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Or. Thank you, Councillor. And we'll remind uh, uh, colleagues that are not part of the committee, other councillors, you are free to uh, ask questions also. I'll give the first opportunity to the committee members first, but any councillor can ask a question. Uh, Catherine Morris, you have the, the floor. Yes. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mancini. Um, I'm, I just wanted to pick up sort of where you left off there and to see if you had any priorities in terms of the Oak Falls that you are aware of that should be signed. If we, for example, were going to do the top mm -hmm. five Oak Falls, um, are there any ones in particular that you would recommend? My, uh, my concern, I think, would be for the Northwest Arm because there's a lot of recreational use of that water body. A hundred percent. Yes, you, you, uh, that, that's exactly right. I think, again, prioritizing uh, recreational spots um, is, is the most important. Uh, and I have to, uh, I'd like to emphasize that you know, recreation is a lot of people think like, oh, recreation in the water is swimming. Only if you're swimming, you're recreating in the water. But even if you're boating or rowing and your paddle hits the water, you, you pull up a line from a mooring, you're touching the water with your hands and then you're touching your face, you're touching, you know, your equipment. When you recreate in the water, any type of recreation, if, if, even if you're not fully submerged, even if you're not swimming and diving into the water, you're still recreating and you're still coming in contact with the water and people have the right to know if it's actually sewage uh, that they're recreating in. And, uh, but yes, to, to your point, absolutely. First prioritize uh, kind of recognize recreational sites, but in the grander uh, scope, and Kelly was touching on that in the beginning of the presentation, that it's also about human uh, kind of recreation and human usage of the water but it's also impacting the, the wildlife and the ecosystem as a whole. So in, in by and large, all of the, uh, all of the outfalls should be, um, you know, signed, uh, meaning that there'll be signage on them and, and kind of kept track of. So it's not only about human recreation in the water. Hey, that's great. Thank you. I, I, in case no one's taken swimming or uh, sailing lessons on the arm, which <laughs> I did a number of years ago, they get they they get everyone to tip the boat over and go right into the arm in order to learn how to right the boat. So it, <laughs> it, it is more than swimming that would be um, where it would be useful to have this information. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any other questions from the committee members? I'm, so I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Lovelace, you have the floor. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. I um, really appreciate uh, this perspective. You know, the, the um, impression one gets is that Halifax Water would want to, uh, in a sense, keep some of that vital infrastructure and its locations private and confidential. Um, for, you know, whatever reasons with regards to the protection of it. Um, and so I, I know that there's roughly 4,000-ish kilometers of underground infrastructure. And so thinking about, um, you know, with the level of construction and so on, the, I think, is it called check before you dig? Um, that infrastructure or that, sorry, that app easily right. identifies and connects um, construction firms and so on with the location of that. Um, I just wonder whether or not there is an extension with an online app, as you mentioned before, it's gotta be mobile friendly uh, where people could learn where these are. But I think more importantly, uh, to your point about the actual uh, contamination, of, uh, of the water sources and of the uh, uh, outlying communities, the wetlands, um, the, uh, you know, the ecosystems that are there. And uh, as a member, uh, as a commissioner for the Halifax Water Commission, this is something that I will be taking forward to them. And, and I, I, I do think that this might be a, a good presentation for the board. Um, I have a, a, a Councillor Daigle Gammon who also sits on the board with me. Um, I, I, so if, if you don't mind, I'd like to make that recommendation and carry that forward to Halifax Water. Um, you know, I know that they, again, are, are concerned about the confidentiality and potential for risk to some of their infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, I think we have to find a way to balance um, uh, that information that the public does need to have. So thank you so much for this. And 
we'll be in touch with you. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. And and yes, and uh, thank you, everyone, also for your time, uh, for taking, uh, you know, spending some some thought about this. And um, I, I think regarding what you're what you're saying about, uh, you know, that maybe it is some organizations or some people would find this kind of counterproductive or they would rather uh, keep this uh, information kind of confidential. I think that the important part is that we all know that fixing the sewage system is, you know, not very sexy. It's not what people want to vote on. It's not what people want to do. Everybody says like, oh, it's too big. We don't want to use, use up all the budget to do this. And whenever you hear um, someone saying stuff like, oh, it's too expensive. Oh, it's too big. Oh, it's not popular enough. The reason for that is because not enough people are outraged by this issue. And I think adopting the, the model alert system, it will really help mobilize the community and have more people outraged and more people wanting to prioritize their waters uh, that will, you know, when enough people want to do something, we can find the budget and we can find the, the balance, like you were saying, uh, on, on getting this, this kind of issue prioritized and worked on, uh, et cetera. So um, yeah, yes, please. And I would love to continue the conversation uh, further. Yes, that sounds good. And, and I just don't want to give the impression that Halifax Water isn't interested in budgeting. Oh, uh, no. this. Absolutely. And, and the integrated, yeah, the integrated um, uh, resource plan, which is a, a very mighty document, uh, it's quite meaty, uh, really does give a sense of where we need to be in the next 30 years. And, and your mm. point is well taken, that, uh, you know, this is about planning for the future. So thank you. Thanks, Or. Those words are never true, or, or uh, uh, with regard to if people uh, uh, want something, uh, we can find a budget for it. And we're seeing that right now with our housing crisis uh, here yeah. in HRM. So uh, well, well stated. Uh, Councillor Austin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Councillor Lovelace covered off um, a good chunk of what I was going to say there in terms of the needing to interface this with Halifax water. Um, you know, I, I would just kind of make the comment that, um, what was it, a couple, it was a couple of years ago now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, just before, uh, I think, the 2016 election, there was, a, I, I do remember there was the, was it fire hydrants or was it storm, storm uh, catch basins? Uh, Halifax Water initially had a position of these are sensitive infrastructure. No, we're not going to release a map saying where, where these all were. Well, you know, uh, there's a reasonable uh, threat assessment that I think you have to carry forward in each of these situations and then weigh it against the overall public good and the utility rightfully on, uh, on sober second thought looked at it and said, yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense to be treating these as ultra sensitive. And I think for the most part, sewage outfalls would be uh, in the same realm uh, that someone would go out and deliberately sabotage the sewage outfall. I mean, I think that's a, what, what would that be? A very, uh, very high risk, but very low probability sort of thing. So, I mean, I think we have to think uh, reasonably about that. Um, the one that uh, putting that piece aside, the thing that should be, easily doable because I know from um, chasing uh, uh, resident inquiries in my district in the past, um, Oat Hill Lake has a very active uh, residence group and they had an algae bloom in that lake um, about two or three years ago, I think it was now. There was a summer and there was just this horrendous bloom broke out on the lake and they were trying to figure out, well, what was going on? And there's actually, it's not an outfall, but there's a sewage pump station station you know up the way and uh so there was concern well was there an overflow at the, at, at that plant at some point that filled the lake full of excess nutrients that then has fueled the algae and so i was able to follow up with halifax water and they were quite responsive in terms of answering the question nope there there haven't been any overflows at this location um that data is very easily grabbable because they have to report overflows to the Department of Environment. So it should not be overly difficult if there's a will to make that information uh, publicly accessible. So uh, I, I wish my colleagues here, Councillor Deagle Gammon and Councillor Lovelace, good luck as commissioners in terms of bringing this issue forward at the, uh, the Halifax Water. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I do get, have a question from um, Councillor Hensby, who uh, is only can able to connect by YouTube. So he's texting me a couple of statements and questions. Uh, the first one, uh, or, you know, uh, have you made this presentation to the Halifax Regional Watershed Advisory Board? Uh, no, as far as I know, this is um, this is the first form that uh, Kelly has brought this to, and um, but we will definitely consider that. I think worthwhile. I, I believe they're looking at uh, combined sewer overflows uh, as a topic, uh, as a project right now. So, uh, Councilor Hensley is suggesting they want to do that, and you can do that by same way by you contacting the clerk's office, and they'll connect to you. Uh, he also shared with me that Halifax Water. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I need to add. Uh, I'm trying to read his questions, bear with me. He's also stating there is mapping of remaining uh, combined sewer overflows since the Great Harbor cleanup project. So it looks like locations are done, and I, I see Pamela, Ca Council Lovelace uh, nodding in agreement on that. And then feeling that there needs to be more public engagement on, on, this, uh, on this topic. Uh, and last comment that he makes is that um, whenever there's a CSO overflow event in his district, he's always been advised of the occurrence and where. So some of it's taking place, but I'm not sure if it's taking place throughout the whole mm -hmm. quality. That's the question. He has. And one last question he's got, is there an open data set on the sewer systems network? Somebody and is as far as I know, no, there is no. Uh, so, so again, uh, the standards for open data has to be that um, uh, that it's machine readable and that it's access uh, accessible all the time, and it's usually kind of in a um, you know a JSON format or a CSV uh, format. And as far as I know, they they don't adhere to all those standards for us to kind of uh, you know build a system that can pull the information. Uh, from the database and present it in um, uh, elsewhere, um, and the, and this uh, this document the uh, the alert uh, system breaks down kind of the way uh, I think it's um, lower um, in the in the in the example for the table of how to report it uh, mm -hmm. the structure that we have that we're recommending would be in the, an open data structure that. Others can pull that information from and create other reports. You know, if, you, if somebody in the community would like to have a report that, for example, compares every May of every year or, you know, whatever sampling that they wanted to do, um, that, that would be uh, available. And in terms of communicating it better to the, to the community, I think that's related to the signage. If the signage would be on site and would direct them to you know, very clearly, here's an interactive map, here's a, an app that you can use or refer to. Um, I think that would, that would really make it easier for the community to, uh, to engage with this topic. Yeah, well, great. Uh, or I, I see no other questions or clarification uh, from the committee or, or other counselors. I, I wanna thank uh, you and uh, Kelly very much for the work that you're doing and presenting to us. Uh, as a follow-up, and maybe reaching out to the clerk's office and speaking to the Watershed Advisory Board and doing a similar type of presentation. But uh, uh, thank you, or thank yeah. you very much, and uh, have a safe day and be, be dry today. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Excellent. So uh, we have one more presentation. Uh, this is 10.3.2, uh, uh, Water Quality of Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes. And I believe we have Donald Gordon uh, on the line with us today. Donald, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Hey, Don. Uh, I can hear you. We can't see you. Are you okay? Uh, okay, you should be able to see me now. There you go. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Don, nice to see you. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, uh, the folks that are on this committee uh, all embrace and love Blue Mountain Birch Cove and the lakes for sure. Uh, so we look forward to your presentation. You have 10 minutes uh, to give your presentation. Is there a slide deck that you have? Yes. Uh, are you sharing that or is the clerk's office doing that? Clerk's office. So the clerk's yes. office can bring up the slide deck and just acknowledge, acknowledge when you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Just let them know when you want to change the slide, uh, Don, yep. and they'll okay. change it. You have 10 minutes. As you get closer to the end of your time, uh, the clerk's office will uh, uh, identify that you're almost out of time. 
So the floor is yours, uh, sir. We look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Councillor Lovelace for suggesting I make this presentation and for the HRM staff to set this up. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, as we know, this uh, urban wilderness park in the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lake area has been under development for many, many years, and uh, many players have been involved. And I, again, just want to express my uh, appreciation of the very strong support that HRM has uh, supplied to uh, the uh, development of the park. And also uh, how exciting it is just the news a few weeks ago mm -hmm. that now uh, in, uh, Parks Canada is going to be involved in this initiative through their National Urban Parks uh, uh, Program. Anyway, there is a, certainly a need as this whole park develops for a baseline water quality in the many lakes. And I organized this project uh, with uh, four other volunteers. We uh, are all retired uh, professionals with experience uh, with various environmental issues and also know how to, how to uh, paddle canoes. The uh, survey was done in early April of this year, right after ice went out when the lakes are well mixed uh, from top to bottom, which is, which is important. Um, we ran three sampling expeditions by canoe. This was quite uh, an effort because we paddled 20, uh, 41 uh, kilometers and there were seven kilometers of portaging the canoes and the uh, equipment. And during this program, we sampled 21 lakes within the conceptual boundary um, and these are lakes in two watersheds, the Nine Mile River watershed to the west that drains into Shad Bay and in the Kearney Run watershed that drains into Bedford Basin. The next slide just shows the uh, route that we uh, followed in red on these three separate days of sampling and the yellow circles indicate the stations where we stopped to take samples. Again, the point to make here is that even though we currently call this Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes, the conceptual park boundary actually goes all the way out to uh, Yankee Town area in Hammonds Plains on, on uh, Cox's Lake. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a very, very large area. Now the next slide just uh, shows uh, the, uh, the uh, team sampling up in uh, Charlie's Lake. So you can see how, how the work was done. The next slide shows the major piece of equipment we use, which uh, was loaned to us very kindly by the Atlantic Water Network at um, St. Mary's University. And it just consists of a probe that you see in the lower part of the photograph that has electrodes for measuring temperature, oxygen, conductivity, and, and uh, pH uh, instantaneously. And this can be lowered in the water uh, from a cable so we can do uh, profiling of the lakes and that the data can be read immediately off the handheld device there on the left. They're also recorded internally for later downloading. Uh, the next slide, please, shows uh, just a very brief summary of some of the data now. Uh, the oxygen, uh, 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 the water was quite saturated with oxygen as we expected. There was really no, no evidence of, of any stratification at the time of mixing. Again, at this time of year, the lakes are very well mixed. Um, however, with time, if we went back and sampled later, for example, right now, we would see quite lower levels of oxygen in the deeper water due to the stratification and the biological processes over the summer. Anyway, in summary, these are normal conditions and there are no real issues here. The next slide. The next slide uh, just looks at the conductivity. Uh, this is a, a measurement of dissolved ions in the water. The, uh, there's quite a range of values that you see there. The lowest values as expected were in the most isolated lakes. 
uh, and they just reflects input, uh, natural input from the bedrock geology. But the highest values were at the lower end of a Kearney Lake watershed, as you see there with the values increasing downstream to the highest levels in Kearney Lake. And uh, the primary source of this uh, of these ions are, are, are thought to be road salt and other uh, chemicals from development in the nearby watersheds, such as Bears Lake and Bedford West. Um, over long term, these values uh, are increasing with time, but they're still below our current uh, uh, guidelines. Um, but this is a major concern and it is an issue that needs to be watched closely. Uh, for, uh, next slide, please is looking at the pH. There again was quite a range of pH. Um, uh, all of our lakes are naturally acidic, uh, but by far and away the lowest levels are in the more isolated lakes in the interior of, 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 the, of the, the uh, park. And these have been uh, somewhat affected recently due to uh, acid precipitation. Um, so most of the values are, are, are a little bit lower than they, than, than they were naturally, but there is evidence from other studies of recent recovery due to emission controls further to the west. The concern here is that values below about uh, 4.5 inhibit the spawning of fish. The next uh, slide, please, is uh, looking at total phosphorus. We did not measure this with the St. Mary's equipment, but we took water samples, which we gave to the province, which they uh, analyzed for us. And the concentrations range from uh, four up to nine, um, all below the trigger point of uh, 10, which is where HRM starts to take a more serious look. Um, all of the lakes fell into the desirable oligotrophic range at the time of sampling. But again, here there still is, is continuing concern and this must, must be watched carefully as development continues and particularly uh, Kearney Lake, which has shown a trend of increasing value of time. Next slide is uh, just a, a very brief summary here. Uh, the lakes well within the conceptual park boundary remain primarily in a natural state except for depressed pH where uh, lakes on the, on the uh, perimeter are affected, particularly in the lower part of the Kearney Run watershed as, as shown there. Next slide is uh, again, just emphasizing that we have created um, a very valuable database for future planning um, that the, uh, where we see the effect of human activity is on the periphery of the park primarily. And this type of monitoring really should continue as the park develops, park use grows and adjacent land use encroaches on the park area. And further monitoring certainly should include the various partners who have worked together in the past at all levels of government as well as volunteers like us and universities. But as this program hopefully will continue, we need to expand it in terms of the sampling frequency. That means taking more uh, samples at other times of the year and also uh, expanding the variables which are measured, which are important water quality indicators. And, uh, and again, any future monitoring work obviously has to be uh, well planned with other uh, water quality initiatives underway. For example, what HRM is doing, which was approved at one of your recent meetings with Emma, Emma Wadi for HRM to continue a, a, a broader program as well as uh, other programs, particularly at Dalhousie University. Next slide is, uh, again, uh, this report has been widely distributed. Um, I earlier sent uh, copies to councillors uh, Lovelace, uh, Morse, uh, Stoddard, and, 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 and uh, Austin, as well as to HRM staff Richard Harvey and Emma Wadi. Um, the report is now posted on the uh, Friends of Blue Mountain Lake website for anyone who wishes to get a copy. And uh, the, all the data have been deposited 
with the uh, Atlantic Water Network uh, website over at St. Mary's. So the data are there for anyone who wants to access them for whatever purpose is needed. Next slide is uh, again, just acknowledgements, particularly the, uh, at the Atlantic Water Network at St. Mary's for providing the equipment and the Nova Scotia Department of Environment and, and Climate Change for their help in setting up the program, getting the, the research permits for the wilderness areas and also um, uh, for their help there and for doing the total phosphorus analyses. And of course, many individuals have been involved, government, university, and uh, NGOs. And finally, uh, I just, next slide, final slide should be, uh, just want to, here's our, our sampling team coming back at the end of the last day. Just want to emphasize uh, and again to express the, uh, the uh, appreciation of the strong support from HRM as this wonderful part does uh, develop and to make the point that as the planning continues, it's important that really all of the partners, all levels of government, university, NGOs must collaborate as we uh, all work together to make this part a reality. Thank you. Well, Don, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, in your opening slide, you had something missing though. You identified seven kilometers of portaging. That's the seven kilometers of portaging with no canoe rests, which adds, uh, if anybody has any man of paddling, to portage and not have a canoe rest uh, is a challenge. So well done to you and to the volunteers. Uh, so we now are looking to see if there's any questions for you, Don. And I think, uh, Councillor Lovelace, uh, you're first uh, on the docket. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really grateful uh, to my committee members and to staff uh, for bringing this presentation forward today. I just wanna extend a huge thank you to uh, Dawn, to yourself for the presentation, to Pierre, Duchenne, Heather and David. What an incredible amount of work uh, to bring this together, you know, but now we have a baseline. So this is so valuable. Um, and I just wanted to, to talk about that baseline a little bit and, and get a sense of, you know, you, the, the condition of the front country is always different from the condition of the back country, um, you know, and trying to uh, ensure that the front country is well used in a very organized manner is important uh, to ensure the longevity and uh, sustainability of that front country. But when it comes to the back country, we don't have as much uh, control over how people are entering and how they're using um, that, that ecosystem and that land and the waterways. And so I'm just wondering what uh, sense do we have um, as far as uh, a commitment or has there been discussions with the Department of Environment of ensuring that we're able to continue this kind of programming and continue to do uh, more testing, you know, potentially at a different time of year as well, Don, um, and looking at, uh, you know, maybe the late fall. Um, and I'm also, I, I just wonder, did you have any evidence of moose? Uh, we just finished a woodland uh, conservation project in French Village and very pleased to see presentation uh, of, of moose tracks and moose uh, in, in that area. So I, I just wanted just to find out if you did uh, have any evidence of moose. Uh, not uh, on this case, uh, but I uh, do own, own property out on Cox's Lake, and I actually have been going out there since the mid-1960s when I first discovered the place and started to ski and to canoe out there. Over the years, uh, many friends in the area and one friend uh, down on Fraser's Lake, I think this is now about 25 or 30 years ago, had a moose go through their property on Fraser Lake. And recently a neighbor of mine told me that a few years ago over in Highland Park, he saw a moose in Highland Park, uh, which I was pleased to hear. But we have, uh, I've never seen any evidence of, of moose out there, beer, bear, uh, yes, and of course lots of deer. Uh, so on this trip, uh, we, we found uh, a, a successful eagle's nest down on Long Lake. That was, that was quite, quite uh, nice to find. As far as your earlier point over 
protecting the lakes on the inner part of the park, I don't see any real, real threat, you know, as long as the, the use is limited to muscle powered sport, you know, hiking or canoeing or, or kayaking. Um, certainly if there was a move to put in roads and opened up to, to motorized vehicles, uh, that would be a mistake. Uh, in my opinion, um, but I, I, I think if, if the access to the inner part of the park was limited to muscle only, uh, that there really isn't any, any real threat to the water quality. Um, and as far as, you know, doing some, some seasonal sampling, uh, actually I've, on, with my own initiative, I have been borrowing this equipment back from St. Mary's and, and, and doing further measurements at different times of year in Cox's Lake, uh, just for my own interest, particularly to look at the changes in the oxygenation levels in the deeper water. So uh, I, I made measurements in July and I'll take, make measurements again in, in um, October. October, thank you, Don. Thank you yeah. for all that you do. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I see Councillor Russell, you're on there. I'm gonna to go to the committee members first, Councillor, and then I'll come back to you, yeah, that's okay with you. Uh, Councillor uh, Morris, so you have the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Don, for all the work that's gone into this uh, incredible study and presentation for us today. Uh, I just wanted to see if you knew that HRM has committed to uh, uh, municipality-wide study of its lakes starting next year. Um, and also wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about some of the key problems you see at Kearney Lake. Um, and wondered if you had uh, looked at the bog next to Kent <laughs> as, a, as a potential, and Bears Lake as a potential source of um, water supply to Susie's Lake. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me just think your questions now. Uh, Carney Lake, what was the first one was? The water uh, quality program that we have, which you- well, yes, right, oh, yes. yeah. No, no, I'm very, very much uh, aware of that. Uh, actually, when we were setting up this study over a year ago, I was dealing with Emma Wadi, who was then with St. Mary's. Um, we had to cancel the program last year because of COVID. Uh, now, as you know, she has uh, moved over to HRM and she's the one who gave the presentation to you, um, mm -hmm. I, I think back in June or so. Uh, so yes, I'm very much aware and very appreciative of the, uh, of the commitment of HRM to continue that monitoring program. And I am in touch with, with uh, Emma and actually she just recently uh, sent me the lakes that they will be sampling in that program. And uh, it's interesting that there seem to be uh, uh, five that fall within Blue Mountain Birch Cove, uh, Ash Lake, Big Cranberry, Kearney, Quarry, and uh, Susie. So these will be sampled. So this will give, give us additional information with uh, an expanded number of, of variables uh, in the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes. Um, regarding the situation in Kearney, um, that is, uh, as you know, at the lower end of the watershed and it basically receives all of the water that comes through all the upstream lakes. And uh, it has been uh, influenced by development uh, over the years, uh, there used to be a sand and gravel quarry on the east side of the, of the highway. Now, of course, there is the construction in Bedford West and uh, there has been a, uh, uh, there was quite a siltation problem over the winter of silt coming down the uh, Black Duck Brook, I believe. Um, the, uh, and uh, Kearney does have the highest levels of conductivity. And the concern here is uh, that uh, we can reach uh, at times levels if the conductivity gets too high, it affects the density of water. And this can affect the mixing of lakes. 
uh, in the spring and the fall. And uh, we've never seen uh, any incident of this here yet, but there are other places in North America uh, where there have been instances where the lake mixing has been retarded because of, of too high salt levels in the deeper water. Um, there was, you are probably aware of the work that has uh, been done over in Sandy Lake. Uh, David Patrickin, uh, having made a water quality observation using the same equipment from St. Mary's University, uh, he was noting the higher levels of conductivity in the deeper water and was concerned about mixing. Um, but he actually did go out this spring with this uh, equipment and was pleased to see that the waters were well mixed in, in, in uh, Sandy Lake. So there is concern there overwatching the conductivity levels. Um, and of course, there is the total phosphorus concern. And uh, uh, if you look in, our, in, in my report, in our report, I, I did summarize the historical data for total phosphorus. And there is a trend of increasing values with time. Although there, at this particular time in our study, the value was nine. Uh, which was just below the threshold of 10. But as you know, there have been past concerns by HRM about total phosphorus in Kearney and downstream in Paper Mill Lake. And a number of studies have been done most recently through Rob Jamison at uh, Dalhousie. So certainly of all of the lakes in the, or in or bordering the park, the one of the most concerned to watch carefully is Kearney Lake. Okay, and I, I don't know if you could comment on that uh, wetland or bog near Kent. Well, I think it's an important part of that watershed, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, we yes. were aware of how important it is. <laughs> no, no, uh, I, I, we haven't done any measurements there. I must admit, I've never really walked in to see it. Uh, but as you know, there is uh, drainage from Bears Lake that goes into Susie, and uh, there would be a lot more uh, uh, potential contaminants going in if the proposed developments north of Kent along just in, in just west of the circumferential were allowed to uh, develop uh, that. So again, you know, Susie Lake is, is also a very, no, it, it's, it's not so bad right now, but the potential for the future there should development take place uh, would uh, could really have quite an impact. And I gather this is an issue that's being looked at now with the regional plan as to whether the development boundary is going to be expanded or not. Great. Thanks again. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Austin, you have the floor. Uh, th <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so uh, we kind of touched on the, the piece there. I just mainly, I just wanted to thank Don and the group there for the work that they've done. Um, you, you would know Mr. Chair from um, our water monitoring uh, report that citizen engagement is exactly the sort of stuff that we want to achieve and partner with. And so this is, this is a fantastic uh, bit of work that's been done. And so uh, I, I don't have anything more than that, Mr. Chair, other than just to thank the group for all that they've done here, because it is very much aligned with what HRM wants to do. So um, very good information to have and good work all around. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Russell, the other floor. Thank you very much. And uh, I echo Councillor Austin's comments. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we would not be able to achieve the same coverage uh, if we were using uh, HRM staff to do the work or, or, or contractors or hiring the work out. So I'm very much appreciative of the work that uh, citizen scientists are doing. And we're doing that on, on First Lake here uh, as well in Lower Sackville. I'm curious about the uh, salinity and, and the conductivity tests. Um, you, uh, uh, you you stated that you believe that it is that the higher conductivity is due to the road salt, um, and and I fully suspect that it is. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you noticed how close any uh, um, any stormwater uh, outflows were to where you were doing the testing, um, and if you will be uh, going back to repeat these tests in those same locations over subsequent years or subsequent months. Um, I'm also wondering if you have done 
testing in different portions of the same lake. Um, we have done some here uh, in First Lake, and I, I've seen E. coli results that uh, clearly indicate that there are different measurements where you would expect to see problems um, and uh, that it's clear where you would expect mm -hmm. there to not see problems. And I'm just wondering if you have uh, considered or seen the same types of things. Uh I answer as follows. The, uh, we selected the sampling to be uh, right after ice went out in the spring uh, when the lakes are well mixed uh, vertically. Um, we also located our sampling stations near uh, the center of the lake over the deepest waters, over the deepest part so that we could get a good identification, a good picture of the vertical profile. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we were not sampling near any uh, inlet streams or or uh, or storm sewer outfalls. Um, we uh, standardly uh, sort of had to have a balance of the number of samples we could do as far as time. But uh, the smaller lakes, we only did one sample near the uh, center. Um, but in the larger lakes, uh, as you can see in the figure in the report. Uh, we, we, we took multiple samples. Uh, I, I, I don't think we took more than three samples in, 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 in the bigger lakes, but I know we did take multiple samples along the access in, in Cox's Lake, Fraser's Lake, uh, Kearney Lake, and uh, Ash Lake, I think. Um, as far as repeating this, uh, I'm sure our team of volunteers, you know, have an interest uh, whether or not uh, we can put something together is something that's the uh, equipment is always uh, was was kindly supplied by by St. Mary's and that probably could be arranged but I I guess a factor here would be the uh, advancing age of all of us volunteers and having to carry the canoes over that distance as much as we enjoy doing it um, should the, should a program like this continue, I think what would be important would be to try to enlist uh, some younger volunteers uh, who could help and sort of take over the responsibility of organizing it in the future. Personally, I would you know, really like to see if it could be repeated, if not every year, at least every, every, every other year. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Gordon. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I will be the first one to say that this is so beyond my area of expertise, but I very much enjoyed reading the reports. It, uh, it was an, a nice read in that way, in terms of educating. One of the things I'm, I'm trying to figure out when we do this kind of stuff, though, is how one project connects to another, connects to another. And um, so I wondered about this information and how it gets to maybe to the watershed advisory committees. Like what, is there a connection there? Um, where does this really excellent information come to their attention and, and how they can use it as well? Um, so I wondered about that. And uh, just that, that last comment about, you know, uh, a younger group may be taking it on and I, where St. Mary's has such an active group there. Um, I'm just wondering if from an academic point of view, is there an opportunity to partner with the university and, uh, you know, one of the course, uh, one of the courses or anything like that. And if there's a way that that, that could happen. Um, and I think the only other question is, yeah, for a team of volunteers to do such a significant piece of work, just our sincere appreciation um, for your dedication to this. And um, I wondered about, uh, just lost my train of thought, but I, I guess I wondered about if it could happen again and with the HRM group, uh, is there a connection then that maybe they might be able to be maybe even the group that looks where there's five lakes that are within the lakes that HRM is gonna study. Uh, does this then become a really nice baseline for them to work from? So that's my comments, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh in terms of getting the information out, um, let me say that I have been involved in water quality studies of our 
local lakes for going on almost 50 years now when I was a member of the Dartmouth Lakes Advisory Board. Um, I also am the one who started the, uh, our, our, syn our synoptic uh, surveys of metro area lakes. They started in 1980 when in one day we sampled 51 lakes with a Coast Guard helicopter and looked at a large number of water quality variables. Um, that program has been continued uh, every approximately every uh, 10 years. And uh, as you may not know, it was repeated this year, uh, 2021, uh, under the leadership of Rob Jamison at Dalhousie. But it, 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 it involved, I believe HRN was involved with funding as well as the province, as well as the university. And this program has developed a long-term database of water quality variables in, in uh, 51 local lakes. The report after the fourth survey is published as a DFO technical report and Rob Jamison is working up the data now. He actually has a graduate student who is developing uh, a report on the data for her master's thesis. Uh, so a point I would make here is that there is a community of people uh, in government um, at different levels and universities, uh, volunteers who have been working together, exchanging information, helping each other over the years such that when our report was done, I sent it out to probably on the order of 25, 30 people who I have contact with, uh, again, in universities, uh, NGOs, uh, the city staff, uh, now with, with Emma Wadi is sort of taking the lead there. And uh, she's uh, taken the place of Cameron Decoff, who used to be with HRM, and he is now with the Provincial Department of uh, Environment. Um, so there is very much a, a very informal network of people who are in touch, share reports, share information. And uh, also I'm really pleased that uh, we were able to post the uh, final report uh, up on the website of the Friends of Blue Mountain Birch Cove for, for those uh, who hear about the report and would like to access to it. So um, I think we have, uh, done a good job of getting the information out. Yep. Councillor? Yep. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing no uh, other questions, I mean, the only question I did have, Don, was already asked and you alluded to, you know, what's the plan for continuing the monitoring? The, your desire would be to do it annually, and I would agree. Uh, the issue, of course, is the, the person power is needed to do so. I think there's lots of opportunities, as Councillor David Gamma mentioned, maybe through the university or just for the youth involved and uh, in the community. The youth has really stepped up, really, they have, uh, uh, and when it comes to the environment. And so, um, you know, if there's any way that we can help to engage some of the youth and schools and such uh, to maybe help the folks mentor them and do that together. Uh, please let us know. But thank you for your work. Thank you for acknowledging the HRM uh, watering uh, monitoring program that's now going to start next year. And that originally was my motion that took a long time to get here. And I'm thrilled that it's here and that Councillor Austin said the key to that motion is really citizen engagement, just like what you folks have done with Blue Mountain Bridge Cove Legs. And so we're uh, excited about that program starting next year. So thank you for your work, Don. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you for bringing Don to the table. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, stay dry today and uh, uh, stay yep. safe, Don. Thank you, sir. And thank we'll you. get to those... Uh, Canoe arrest because maybe we get a couple more years out of you. We get a couple of canoe rests on those lakes, right? On those okay. Lakes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. All right, colleagues. Uh, two great presentations. That was fantastic. Uh, we're now going to move on to the rest of our agenda. And next is uh, number 11 information items brought forward, and there are none. And then we come to reports and staff reports. And I'm going to turn the chair over to Councillor uh, Morris. Thank you. And uh, are we going to have the staff presentation right away then? Yeah, yes, please. I think that's the, and then uh, after the presentation, I can put the motion on the floor and we'll have the discussion. Very good. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Good Chair, afternoon. Chair of the committee and guests. Uh, my name is Shannon Betts, and I'm the Diversion Policy Coordinator for Halifax Solid Waste. Uh, solid waste plays a role in the awareness and enforcement of litter, and this report was a collective effort between us and the department to manage and collect litter on a daily basis in HRM. My colleagues uh, will help answer questions following the presentation. And uh, with us today, we have Superintendents Andrea Maynor and Beata Shannon from Road Operations and Construction, and Superintendent Rob Mullane and Director Ray Walsh from Parks and Recreation. Next slide, please. So this presentation will briefly summarize the report and recommendations that were based on the motions made by committee members in two previous um, meetings of ESSC. So we'll be looking at the current litter management practices in HRM, the public space litter receptacle criteria, uh, customer satisfaction with litter control measures, a jurisdictional scan, the cost of litter, uh, litter awareness programs, and then a summary of the recommendations in the report. Next slide, please. Litter is very visible in our community and therefore among the most commonly reported nuisance that we see. The information that we have about litter is highly subjective. Therefore, measuring the success of litter management programs, including the location and number of bins and the impact of community-based cleanups is challenging. The majority of litter receptacles we see in the municipality are installed and maintained by road operations and construction or rock and parks. These include around 750 pole mount bins and receptacles at bus stops and in the right of way, and about 1400 receptacles in parks, playgrounds and sports fields. These bins are serviced with 24 seven coverage on multiple routes with many being empty daily. Staff react to complaints around overflowing bins or scattered litter on a daily basis as those complaints come in. Additionally, throughout the municipality, we have bins installed and maintained by active transit groups on our multi-use trails, developed Nova Scotia on the waterfront, and bins at private businesses. Next slide, please. So lids on bins do help limit access by animals and blowing debris. Um, this has mainly been a concern with um, the 45 gallon drum bins that we see throughout, throughout the region. Since 2018, parks have been able to install covers on about 37% of these barrels. And as we look at replacing other types of bins that we use, such as the pole mounts, um, options are being reviewed for more contained bins to further prevent litter from blowing out of the bin and to protect the contents from being scattered by animals. Next slide, please. As part of preparing this report, staff re reviewed some existing criteria for placement of receptacles, um, which was included in as attachment A of the report. This document was updated um, to combine criteria from parks and ROC to ensure consistency between the departments. So requests for new receptacles can be made by residents by calling 311. In 2020, 186 requests were received by staff and following site inspections and a review of the history of the area, new receptacles were installed in 62% of these locations. So some of the locations where we would um, install bins are areas with mixed use businesses and frequent pedestrian presence. Um, often we'll have receptacles at the end of blocks of a street block and within the middle of a, a block if um, depending on the length of that, of that stretch. We have receptacles installed at transit stops that have high use, uh, parks, playgrounds, beaches, sports fields. There are many receptacles outside of municipal facilities. And as previously mentioned on active trails that are maintained by community groups. HRM staff do not service litter receptacles that are outside of the core area or, or that are within the Nova Scotia TIR boundary of service. Next slide, please. Um, just to give a bit of a snapshot of some of the feedback that we've had um, from residents in a sort of a more formal way. Um, over the last four citizen surveys, an average of 64% of respondents indicated that they were satisfied with service levels related to litter control and graffiti removal. 
and a majority of those surveys indicated a preference for these service levels to be maintained. Next slide, please. So in conducting a scan of other municipalities, uh, we found the approach that they take to addressing litter is quite similar to, to that that we employ in HRM. Um, whereas there are several different departments or organizations or groups or contracted staff who are playing a part in managing at different aspects of collecting litter. Uh, placement of the receptacles are, are also identified on an as needed basis by staff um, and evaluated on a case by case basis. Um, it's very common across the jurisdictions that were reviewed that additional staff were hired to help manage litter during the summer when tourist traffic and just general activities increased throughout the, the municipality. Um, in HRM, our enhanced maintenance area group hires six additional staff and four students between May and November to manage um, community cleanup requests, um, downtown sweeps, special events, and additional litter runs and maintenance of the bins due to the increased pedestrian and tourism traffic. And that's, that happens both within the core area as well as outside of the core. Park staff assigned 10 additional seasonal staff to assist in litter during peak seasons between May and the middle of September to assist with the increase of litter in parks and for weekend service in parks that have large usage, um, including beaches. Next slide, please. When looking at costs, there was very little financial information that was um, provided by the municipal other municipalities that we scanned. Um, we did uh, we were able to get some information from the city of Edmonton, who let us know that um, they have a budget in their right of way for the right of way receptacles of about eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year, and that covers seventeen hundred receptacles, so they're averaging about five hundred dollars per bin. Um, in addition to that, they have a separate uh, service agreement for their transit stops, and they indicated that each time a receptacle at a transit stop is emptied, it costs $2.50. So if you're looking at uh, four services per week, then the cost per bin would be about $520 per year for receptacles at transit stops. Next slide, please. So as far as litter awareness goes, our Litter Doesn't Belong Here campaign was developed following discussion at this committee around cigarette butts in 2018. The concept has now been adopted by other municipalities and waste regions in Nova Scotia, so we are starting to see the campaign spread. Um, as the campaign evolves, we see opportunities to enhance messaging to drive home the message that it is socially and environmentally unacceptable to litter. Keeping litter prevalent as a discussion point and encouraging action is important. Residents should know what the municipality is doing about litter and need to know and understand that everyone is accountable for managing the litter that they, that they generate. Over the fall and winter of this year, Solid Waste will be working on developing an enhanced web page for litter and illegal dumping on halifax.ca as part of our efforts to enhance awareness around municipal litter activities. Uh, so some of the things that we're looking at including include enforcement statistics, municipal litter management and maintenance efforts, a GIS map showing locations of litter receptacles around the municipality, um, including the placement criteria that has been developed, uh, information on how to request a bin to be installed, and information on how to volunteer or conduct a community cleanup. Touching on the GIS mapping, um, we think that this map gives an opportunity for residents to physically see where the bins are located, how many are available, and perhaps identify if there's one identified on the map that's, no, that's not um, actually in the place that it's supposed to be. So they would be able to report this to HRM or through 311 and uh, we'd be able to resolve that issue. Having this data will also allow us to map problem areas in relation to bin placement. And this is something that we would look towards doing when we have um, a bit more access to some qualitative data about what type of litter is showing up in what parts of the municipality. Next slide, please. So with the recommendations, um, 
we feel that the placement criteria that's presented in, an, in attachment A will give staff um, the ability to address placement of bins on a per request basis within a set, a set of standards, but also give us the flexibility to be able to move bins and uh, put them in places that may not ne necessarily fit exactly within that criteria, um, really addressing and pinpointing where the problem areas are. Um, with recommendation two, uh, increasing public awareness of the criteria, we can help the public understand the resources that are needed to manage litter. And by more clearly communicating the steps and actions the municipality is taking within regards to litter, residents can see how they can contribute to mitigating or addressing litter and request placement of receptacles in areas that they're seeing issues with in their local community. It's also important for us to continue and to increase the message that litter is, littering is socially and environmentally unacceptable. Finally, to address um, the issue of blowing litter from receptacles, um, the plan is, as mentioned before, to have lids on those 45 gallon barrels by the end of 2022. And um, us reaching that goal is, is primarily dependent on inventory and supplyability, but um, we do believe that uh, moving forward with that is, is certainly achievable. Uh, last slide, please. So just in conclusion, um, you know, those who choose to litter are, are certainly creating a nuisance and a burden for their fellow citizens and the municipalities to clean up. Strategic placement of bins can definitely encourage proper disposal. However, it's not the final answer. Increased awareness of the harm that litter can do along with the awareness of the consequences of littering are steps that we are trying to take to impress that change. So thank you for your time and uh, we're happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon, for the presentation. And is, uh, are there any questions? So um, uh, I'll uh, put the motion on the floor. Uh, uh, okay, floor. right, please. Uh, I put the following motion on the floor that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to one, maintain existing public space literary receptacle criteria set out in attachment A of the staff report dated August 25th, 2021 to ensure continuing uh, consistency and collaboration across departments and agencies who manage litter in the municipality right away or public spaces, i.e. right away parks, sports fields, and trails. Two, increase public awareness of replacement criteria and service standards for litter receptacles as part of ongoing municipal campaigns, including publishing a map identifying the location of receptacles. And three, continue purchasing lids for all 45 gallon litter drums to address concerns of blowing litter and animal access so move. Second. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair and, uh, and uh, colleagues and Shannon, thank you very much for your presentation. So I mentioned in the last presentation we had on Blue Mountain Birch Cove that my um, water monitoring program motion was one of my first motions. I believe this was my very first motion which it took a long time to get here. And I am displeased how long it took. It went through a number of hands. And I know that's not you, Shannon, in your department. You're actually the group that helped to put it, bring it together at the end. Uh, but I was very frustrated it's taken this long because litter has not gone away. It's increased. And so anyhow, that, that it is what it is. I'm pleased that it's here for discussion and debate today. I, I am a little disappointed in the recommendations that I uh, just put on the floor that you just shared with us because when I created this motion or I asked, I put this motion on the floor, I was looking for solutions. I was looking for solutions in response to the many requests of garbage cans. Uh, I was looking for solutions of litter as most municipalities across the province are, are struggling with. Uh, and I see some of that here. Uh, I, I don't, I still am, uh, there's still a gap in my opinion of what we need to do, particularly around litter. Uh, you know, I was glad to see in the report that, you know, in 2020, there was 182 requests for garbage cans and actually 116 were delivered. I think you said that's around 62%, which is, I was surprised it was that high because I guess I hear it back from my residents when I they ask for a can and they get the answer no. And that's always tough because to a resident, they see, you know, Mrs. Jones sees a bus stop in front of their house and they see no garbage can, there's litter there. 
And then our criteria is with bus stops, as an example, that uh, if the bus stop has a certain low level of uh, ridership, it doesn't qualify for a garbage can. But Mrs. Jones still has garbage in front of her house each day. And that's very frustrating to get that no and to have that conversation with Mrs. Jones because she looks at us and says, I just want a garbage can. So there's not litter in front of my house. So that, that, that is frustrating. I would like to find out if there's any any improvement with regard to our new illegal dumping rules, which was yet another motion that I brought forward. Now that that's in place, and I don't know if it's been in place long enough to make a difference, but if you could comment on that. Um, you talk about a campaign and uh, litter doesn't belong here campaign is a good campaign and it's well done and it's very professional. But in my opinion, uh, we need to get to, you alluded to a couple of times in the presentation, Shannon, making litter socially unacceptable. That's where we have to get to. So maybe we need another campaign that's a little stronger, showing visitors coming off the uh, cruise ship in downtown and looking at you know, an overflowing garbage can or looking at litter behind a building or a business considering coming to Burnside or Lakeside and saying on the way to drive in uh, all this litter and maybe that's a decision they don't come they don't come here we, we need to get stronger with that message in my opinion I'm seeing many of my colleagues shake their head in agreement with that that's socially unexpected uh, unacceptable that's where we need to get to and I, I'm not sure how to get there Shannon but we really need to, to get there you know it's interesting where we're able to identify and I'm glad to hear that you can bring forward a map uh, on where the locations of the, the receptacles are my question is, you know, is that going to be an app, you know, where because a map, no one's going to walk around with a map. But if I have an app on my phone and I'm downtown Dartmouth and I'm at Lake City Cider with my friend Sam Austin and I'm walking away, where can I put my my garbage uh, that I have? So is that going to be an actual app? You know, talking about data, data is gold, as we all know in council. Data gives us evidence. And so the challenge we see is do we know where litter is? Yeah, you know, I, I know that there's some agencies in the province that are they're looking at litter, but they're literally going out there with a clipboard in hand and trying to, there, there is another way. And I know that you're looking at that. And so for my colleagues, could you talk about what you're looking at and how that possibly works? Because we need the data. We need to be able to identify where is the litter located? Where is that litter coming from? Uh, is, is some of that litter coming from a, a particular type of business? Can we influence that business or that industry? That data is critical. So if you could talk about what the, uh, your department is doing and look at considering uh, on that. Uh, could you also talk about drive throughs You talked about what we don't do. I get a lot of calls is that I used to go through Tim's or McDonald's, or whatever, and they used to have a garbage can, but they don't anymore. And so, uh, and, and why is that happening? You also mentioned, you know, 64% of the people that responded to the survey were satisfied with litter control. Comes to litter, we need uh, much higher percentage of our residents uh, being satisfied and I'm not satisfied with the way we have litter though it's interesting just very quick I know I'm running out of time here Madam Chair but when I was the uh, uh, deputy mayor I hosted a lot of people from outside the uh, our, our community and I would ask them what they think and I heard quite often two things they said they felt that HRM was very safe and they felt it was very clean isn't that ironic <laughs> because what are the complaints that we all get that it's not safe enough, but it's not not, not that clean. Uh, Edmonton, you mentioned about measuring uh, about, about Edmonton and the money they spend. Do you have any stats on a measuring of Edmonton? You know, when it comes to litter, are they consider a cleaner city than us? I don't know if that was part of what you looked at, but you're looking at they have yes, we're spending more money, we have more receptacles, but are they a cleaner city than us? And I don't know if you can answer that. And uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, the other piece is how many times, colleagues, do we get calls about a ramp that's full of litter? And who is responsible for that that ramp? It's the province, right? So very often, you know, that communication that, that you're creating to go out to educate our residents, you know, maybe making communication. If you see a ramp or see these areas, that belongs to the province, not us. So it's adding that to it also. Um, and those are my questions. I'm sorry if I went over, but... Uh, uh, oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Shane. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, through you to the committee um, and the councillor. Um, I'll try to I'll try to get through all the. I was making okay. notes, so I'll get all the points that uh, that you asked about. 
Um, I think a lot of them are probably summed up a bit in the plan that we have for implementing our illegal dumping and our litter, our litter enforcement program this fall. Um, as the changes went through for bylaw S600 earlier this year, we were able to um, increase the um, abilities that we have around enforcement of illegal dumping and litter. So um, we are working on that plan and um, have uh, are on track for implementation of that um, to be integrated into solid waste enforcement this, this October. So that will encompass um, an education campaign as well. Um, talking about campaigns and um, promoting um, the social unacceptance of littering is, is definitely something that, um, that we're, we're uh, looking to do and, and really coming out with something bold and eye-catching that's really going to um, talk about all of those issues. And um, they really play well in together, even though you know, illegal dumping and litter are, are different issues. Um, we feel that the overall increase in the awareness of, um, of those issues is, is definitely um, integrated and, and very close, closely connected. Um, we, um, um, let me just see here. Okay, so app, so you asked about um, app with locations of litter receptacles. Um, so I think that's a great idea. It's certainly something that we can look at. Um, you know, I know that in the past there have been maps um, available to show things like where the location of public washrooms or where um, water fountains were available that you could refill your water bottle with. So um, I think that's certainly something that, that can be looked at. I mean, definitely mobile devices are a lot more um, user-friendly as far as looking at things like that on, online. So um, we'll definitely look at the um, integrated or how that can be in integrated into um, different options. Um, with respect to data, um, I 100% agree. Um, data is definitely gold. And um, we have recently been speaking with um, the developer of, of an app um, who um, that uh, actually presented at ESSC at the last meeting, um, Literati. So um, it's a program that we're interested in pursuing. Um, basically having that level of data and being able to go out on the street and track what kind of data is in what locations um, has a wealth of, of opportunity for us. So um, it can help us identify what types of litter are in what types of areas, where that litter is in relation to the receptacles we are. So that could help us improve our bin placement. Um, it may be a matter of moving a bin, you know, 20, 30 meters down a street so that it's in a more optimal location. Um, it also helps us identify that what the litter is made up of. So right down to the brand owners of that. So as we start talking about things like EPR, um, we can integrate that um, type of data into the conversations we're having with industry to um, help them understand the impact that, um, that they're having on um, the litter that's, that's being generated in the municipality. Um, the next point I had was around drive-throughs. Um, drive-throughs are part of the um, implementation for litter um, enforcement that we're looking at. Um, we're in the process right now of developing communication to industry so that we can notify the, um, the uh, locations that have drive-throughs of the new bylaw provisions. So, you know, considering that we're coming um, through restrictions and whatnot uh, related to COVID, we wanted to be able to, we want to be sensitive to um, what they're going through and what they're dealing with kind of rebounding from that. So we want to let them know um, what the expectations will be as far as having receptacles and drive through. And we're really focusing on, on that as a, a mitigation um, approach for litter in the general area of, of those businesses. Um, the next point I had was Edmonton and talking about stats on measuring how clean. Um, we didn't get that level of information from any of the cities that we surveyed. Um, so I, I wouldn't know what uh, sort of their customer satisfaction um, statistics would be. I think a lot of um, when we talk about success and, and how effective litter is, um, it does come down to complaints received. And um, anecdotally talking to other people who um, are in my line of business, um, the general feedback I get is that, you know, the residents of, of that particular city 
feel that the city is full of litter and needs to be cleaned up. Whereas, you know, as, as we hear from a lot of people who visit Halifax, um, they don't think that it's nearly as, as dirty or as littered as, as what someone who uh, lives here may, may think. So, you know, there's a lot of perception within that, that um, we need to, um, that we need to talk about. Um, and uh, around litter, um, I think that's a really good point as well, you know, as part of um, how we're educating and when we're educating people about what to do about litter and what they can do. I think an important piece of that is going to be letting them know, you know, if you see litter in on an, on an exit ramp or on a highway, this is who you need to contact. And if you see litter within municipal boundaries, then, you know, contact us at 311. So I think I, I think I touched on everything that you um, answered or you asked, but um, happy to circle back if there are any yeah. further questions. Good job, Shannon. And I'm sure I'll come back a second time and let my colleagues speak more. Thank you, no Shannon. Problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Deputy. And um, uh, thank you, staff, for the presentation and Councillor Mancini for bringing this forward all those moons ago. <laughs> this has been a long time from coming. Um, so I had a similar reaction to Councillor Mancini when I read the stat. I was like, oh, actually, most of these, most of the calls requesting a garbage can actually end up in the affirmative, right? Because as a as a councillor, I guess maybe there's a little bit of selection bias. You get the ones in which the resident is upset because a garbage can hasn't been hasn't been provided. So uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised by the number because uh, you know I've joked to a, a couple of uh, folks at times that 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 sometimes the hardest thing to do in this job is to get a garbage can. So uh, that was that really was an eye opening stat to have in the report. Um, so really thank uh, staff for gathering that piece up. Um, uh, the question I have, and you know, apologies, I understand it's not something you can answer right now. I know one of the challenges we have with our garbage cans is, um, you know, they're designed for that occasional use. Someone's having a coffee, they drop the, the used coffee cup in the garbage can to carry on their way. Where we tend to fall down at times is, on them is so there's a picnic party in the park. And instead of that, just that kind of habitual use, suddenly there's like 10 pizza boxes stashed into that. And the only way that anyone ever comes to check that garbage can um, outside of the regular schedule is if someone then makes a 311 call. Um, so you, you tend to have those situations that pop up. Um, but I know, have we, have we ever made a serious look at the technology side of things? Because some cities have gone the route of, you know, smart garbage cans where the can actually will report, um, hey, I'm full. Um, and then the routes that are being generated for the employees to go follow um, are actually the routes of the garbage cans that are full rather than sending employees around on a set schedule to each can, whether that can needs to be emptied that day or not. Um, have we ever made a real look at that as an, as an option? Um, thank you for the question um, through, through the chair to uh, the councillor. Um, we have actually done trials in the past with the big belly bins. Um, you'll see them down on the waterfront in Halifax, Dartmouth, Bedford um, that are managed by Develop Nova Scotia. Um, we did have some challenges with those in the past and uh, perhaps maybe Andrea might be able to give a little bit more background on, on those um, and what the experience we had with them was. Yeah, no, Shannon, I definitely can. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm just going to bring my video up here and I'll hook you guys right up. Hi, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to the committee. Uh, good afternoon, Councillor Mancini. Great to see you, Councillor Austin. Um, I can address the big belly question for sure. Uh, we've got lots of experience. We did, a, we did a pilot run with big bellies. We actually have we still have eight in the municipality that are HRM run, um, but at one time we had 14 or 15 spread throughout the downtown core of, uh, we stayed on the Halifax side for this trial, but um, one of the biggest issues with uh, the automated litter receptacles um, is that, well, so current, current, current problems we have are pretty frequent malfunctions. Uh, so if someone chucks a pizza box in it, um, which actually won't fit, through the, through the garbage opening. Um, it will report that it's full, 
So we will go down, send a staff member in a truck to go down to park on Spring Garden Road and empty that litter receptacle, which potentially only has one pizza box in it. Um, so we actually found that with the missed communications from the boxes to us, the big belly boxes, sorry, um, we were getting, we were get, actually doing more work than saving work. Um, what we tend to do is uh, we've got, we've got proactive hotspots throughout the municipality um, and throughout the downtown core, we get so much um, proactive street litter uh, that what we do is, is we've, we've, what we've found is that we're in the same vicinity as that big belly, regardless of whether it's called us to go empty it or not. So my staff will be down there just on regular road patrol, picking up cigarette butts on Argyle Grafton street. And while they're there, they'll, they're checking the big belly regardless. So the fact that it's not emailing and saying, Hey, I'm full, come empty me. Um, for us, it's we're down there anyway, we're going to look at it every single time we go down there. So it doesn't particularly make sense for us in the downtown core. Um, we've run into some other really major problems with them, not to mention the fact that they're about seven grand each. Um, they will not service them once they give them to us. And nobody in the municipality um, that we've found uh, services the big bellies. They're, they're quite complicated. They're solar powered. Um, so we had the last vendor that we had from Big Belly was from Montreal. So when we needed something serviced, they had to send someone from Montreal to come and service it. So we were at pretty exorbitant costs. Um, the reason the ones on the waterfront for Develop Nova Scotia work relatively well, they have a dedicated staff member who only takes care of the mechanical and Big Belly um, litter receptacles that they have. And they have, I believe right now, they approximately have eight. Um, but they're not looking to renew with Big Belly Solar either. Um, they're they're, they're going to get out of the game. Last I talked to John, they're going to get out of the game. And the reasoning for that is, again, same with them. They don't need the can to email them to say that it's full uh, because their staff are walking the boardwalk every day anyway. They'll look at that can five times a day to make sure that it's not overflowing. And that in itself is offsets the cost of buying something to tell them that they're, that the can is full. Um, I believe that we have actually talked about this in the past where the, when it comes to big bellies and um, we did, we did talk about this and I, and I did suggest to you that it might be a great idea for like a garbage can and Ecom Seekum that, you know what I mean? So no, someone doesn't have to drive all the way out to Ecom Seekum to see if that litter receptacle is full because we don't, that's not on our normal, uh, our normal routing. So that might actually make sense. Absolutely. Um, but within the core, our staff are, to be honest, just they're on site too often for it to make to, for it to make financial sense for us. Um, we have, on the other hand, moved to some of the litter receptacles uh, that are. So one of the pluses of the Big Belly is it's a sealed unit. Um, so no animals, no rats, no smell. Uh, so it's great for the downtown core areas um, in and around the patios, Spring Garden Road, um, downtown Dartmouth, Portland Street. They'd be they'd be great. Those sealed units. Um, but we actually found a non-mechanical option for sealed unit, and we're looking at those for the uh, 2022 season. Awesome. Well, it's uh, th thank you for that really detailed uh, update on this. It, it has been a number of years since we last talked about it. It's uh, it's great to have the operational staff actually here at council, right, to, <laughs> to provide. So uh, thank you for that, Andrea. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave the big bellies to uh, uh, aside for now based on, based on that very solid answer. Thank you. Thank you. And just before we go to the next question, uh, Haruka, do we, um, are we running into any time issues? I notice we're about 15 minutes away from three o'clock here. Are, do we have enough time allotted for the meeting through, uh, for an online meeting? Uh, yes. So there's one more item left, but Zoom meeting will continue even past three. So all good. Great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, the next question is uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Shannon. Um, and thank you, Andrea. You actually answered uh, part of my question too that Sam, you got to ask. I, one of the things I'm kind of, I, I wonder if there's a distinction and Andrea you pointed to a little bit at the very end there between the urban core and then suburban and rural around HRM properties and litter. Um, you know, I, I know in suburban rural, we have such a humongous issue around illegal dumping and we've had good conversations, Shannon, about that in the last little while. Um, and when we talk about the, and so, the, but the same thing though, um, a lot of questions I've had about, we'd like to have a garbage can, but when we go to find out, we find that we don't meet the criteria for one reason or another. So that's not gonna happen. Um, 
But I'm wondering about the campaign a little bit and, you know, sort of that the thing that we're all responsible for litter. And so it doesn't just, you know, I could pick something up just as easily as making a phone call to 311. Right. So I'm wondering about the campaign, if there's anything about our own responsibility, much like, you know, you say safety is everybody's responsibility in the workplace, workplace safety. Is there a way in the campaign that we're going to be talking about? It's everybody's responsibility. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there's going to be a component there, because I think that's really, really important. I see that in a lot of the trails and hiking trails. You know, I, I will see people uh, come carrying garbage bags out if there has been something and it's overflowing, like some of that uh, self initiative. But I, I don't know if in any way uh, that's an impediment or they shouldn't be. But anyway, there, there's a, a few questions I have about that. And then the other thing I have, and, and I'm, I'm curious about this, um, and I know Rob has helped us a little bit in, in the past, but there's one site, for example, on um, uh, Rocky Lake Road. Uh, there's a park there. It's not an HRM park, but we, a bunch of volunteers maintained emptying the garbage can. And, uh, you know, we just exhausted everybody. So we got rid of the garbage can. And there's less litter. When the garbage can was there, it would be overflowing. It was on the ground. And so, like I said, we all got tired and got rid of the garbage can. And all of a sudden, we don't have three quarters, like literally. Uh, I've been there a couple of times just doing a little check myself. And there, there's almost no litter at all. So I guess I'm just curious about that. And is that something that that uh, we've seen in other places? Um, so is it, and I guess maybe that's a little bit about knowing where is the litter happening, um, that kind of stuff. But it, it was just a curiosity that I thought I might share and see if you have any thoughts about that. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, thank you for the question um, through the chair to, to the counselor. Um, that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I, and I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, having some better qualitative data would greatly help us in being even more strategic with placement of bins. Um, you know, you're, you're right on, you know, a lot of times we, we do see um, when we have barrels or, or bins of, of any sort that they tend to attract, um, they tend to attract the litter. Um, so it, it does happen. So, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to have to have bins in a place that's not generating material like at that site. Um, your point about um, campaigns, um, definitely, uh, you know, those are all great points and things that we want to really incorporate into this, into this plan and to really, you know, kind of get into people's faces and, and be really, you know, upfront about, about our responsibility collectively. Um, you know, it's, it's not fair that, that some people are kind of ruining it, ruining it for the rest of us and leaving that, that waste behind for volunteers and people who are trying to enjoy our natural spaces to, to have to pick up after them. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely excellent points that, that we are considering. And, and if I might just follow up, uh, uh, Madam Chair, for a moment, uh, the only other thing I was wondering if where people might take the responsibility for themselves, is there any way at those locations um, you know, that there could be extra garbage bags. So if we're going to like take garbage away, is there a garbage bag there that we can refill? So something that gives people the tools to be able to contribute as well. That's a really great idea. And I'll, I'm going to take that back and we'll, we'll certainly discuss opportunities for, for something along those lines. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Loveless. Uh, thank you. Um, really great report. Thanks for the for all of the insight. And thank you, Councillor Mancini, for bringing this forward. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Austin, for raising my point <laughs> about, uh, you know, solar powered and, and using technology. Um, so, Andrea, if you want to drop one of those off in Bishop's Park in Hubbard's, I'd love to have one of those uh, in the rural area. I think it would be a great little pilot. Uh, it's a well used park on Shore Road. And, um, you know, I just think it'd be really interesting to, to get a sense of how that big belly could work in a rural setting. Um, and uh, so I guess my point that hasn't been raised is around enforcement, Shannon, and, and looking at how we change the attitude 
Obviously, social marketing does help. Um, the education and awareness helps, especially with young people, um, you know, who uh, I think if we can get them, the younger they are, you know, we can get them to create those good positive habits uh, in the community and uh, and for their neighborhood and, and, and their, their city. So um, I think the issue uh, that I'm most concerned about is the non-threat of enforcement and the fact that uh, folks don't know, are there actually people who get fined for littering? Uh, you, you know, there it, it, it's the, the belief is that no, nobody actually gets fined. There's just this sign that says, hey, you know, there's a big fine, you're, you're, you can't litter here. But I mean, I could take you to 10 different places uh, in the district where Friday, Saturday nights, the kids are there and all the McDonald's and Tim Hortons trash is left there. And so those neighbors that are close to that area, they end up picking it up every weekend. Um, and so, you know, I'm just, I'm wondering how we could increase the awareness of the enforcement if it actually is a threat. Um, and, uh, you know, and I agree too. the placement of bins. Thank you uh, for raising that Councilor Daigle Gammon, because that is, <laughs> it, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that as well. Um, you know, the, 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 the data itself, I think is really what helps people understand the significance and the depth of the issue. And so even just having some kind of dashboard that gives us a monthly outlook, you know, here's how many pieces of litter, or here's how many different spots for the municipality are significantly impacted by litter. I think that might be really helpful. But the other thing I wanted to add, one last quick point, Madam Chair, thank you, uh, is on the rewards. So on one hand, we're threatening people, you're going to get a fine. Uh, but what about the rewards for the community groups that are doing a great job picking up the litter, um, you know, and just thinking about how we can actually give folks a pat on the back for keeping the neighborhood clean. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, for you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. Um, yeah, those are all great, great points. Um, and um, talking about like the non-threat around enforcement, um, part of our plan in um, promoting and discussing our illegal dumping and litter enforcement is to provide stats perhaps on a monthly or quarterly basis. So, or if, um, you know, in those cases, if, if we do issue fines or we have su successful prosecutions, it is something that we would be looking at um, making public and talking about it so that people do see um, that someone has been um, held accountable for that. Um, I guess to be, to be frank about it, you know, um, issuing tickets to, for someone who like threw a chip bag or something on the ground is a little bit more challenging, I think, um, because it's something that you have to witness. But I, I do think that there are some opportunities that, um, you know, we can look um, at ways that we can um, incorporate that into the fold of what we're what we're talking about when it comes to enforcement. So um, definitely all things that, that we've been talking about, we are looking to incorporate into our plan. Um, the idea about the rewards um, for groups who are doing great jobs, I think that's, that's very important as well. And um, something that we try to work with our, um, our counterparts at the provincial level through the Nova Scotia Adopt a Highway program and the Great Nova Scotia Pick Me Up mm -hmm. to recognize community groups definitely an area of opportunity that we can we can look at in enhancing as we move forward with this. So thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, thank you so much. And I wonder too if there's an opportunity to highlight um, you know, the importance of community engagement in recognizing where the litter is. So, you know, similar to what we've seen the, with bird watchers, you know, they have that app and they indicate, yep, this is exactly where, you know, the GPS is located. We picked up a, a garbage here, picked up garbage there. And so you get um, public engagement throughout the entire municipality on this one issue. At the same time, we've got the social marketing campaign running. At the same time, we've got an increase in the fees. You know, I think we're going to see a higher level of understanding and 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 watch that litter uh, drop throughout the municipality. So good work to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I see that, I guess, just circling back to the um, discussion about the Litterati app. And I, I think that the timing of all of this is, is really great because we have that opportunity to capture that that data, you know, someone takes a picture of a piece of litter that they see, we have the GPS coordinates, they can share that on social media, 
and it gets that conversation going. So I, I, yeah, I think that's all really well placed and, uh, and great timing. So. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mancini for the second time. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, interesting to see Andrea show up on the screen. Uh, good to see you, Andrea, but it also means summer really is over because once we see Andrea, it means the snow is going to fly. So uh, sorry for that, Andrea, I just had to say that. But uh, 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 so the, the, uh, fine for littering. I mean, that, that's right. I mean, do we have the litter police and does that exist? And uh, you're right. I, I like uh, Councillor Lovelace's comment about reward uh, rather than punishment, but it gets frustrating at times. I wish we could find somebody 25 bucks for throwing that, that wrapper on, on the ground because I gotta go back to that socially uh, unacceptable to do so. Uh, you talked about EPR and I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a few seconds and talking about extended producer responsibility and how, if that happens in the province, how that might impact the litter and Maybe time also, Shannon, that because we have so many new councillors that uh, another presentation is done at regional council for extended proof responsibility. And so if I can be helpful for that, let me know. But I think it's time that we do that. Um, special events, Sam, you alluded to it. Councillor Austin alluded to, uh, you know, in uh, Councillor Austin's area, we have Lake Banook. We had, uh, we, had, we had regattas going on all summer. So all of a sudden there's a higher number of people gathering in a smaller spot and then we get calls of both those 45 gallon drums overflowing could you share with us shannon is there any uh, anything done that's around special events when you know special events are going on uh, a number of years ago i attended a, a workshop at, at, at disney university and if you've ever been to disney it's uh, amazing to see a parade happen every day parades over and then within about uh, 30 minutes, you couldn't tell there was a parade, right? They've got it down to a science and around special events and yeah, keeping the litter away. Um, regional council, when you come to regional, I believe this has to go to regional council, what we're talking about today. I, I do ask that a presentation be offered to regional council, similar to what you did with us today, so they're aware of it. And, you know, the volunteer awards we have each year, maybe Council Lovelace, we should have a special category for that litter champion distinctive, right? So we really celebrate. I, I see, I have neighbors of mine that are retired. Every day they walk, they go with bags in their hand that are empty and they come back full because they're out walking anyway. And another, it's another vote to that uh, literary uh, uh, app type of approach. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor Lovelace, um, so starting with EPR, so um, what we're seeing lately with some of the new, the um, more recent extended producer responsibility legislation that's being implemented and proposed, um, New Brunswick, for example, has this as a clause in their regulations that in addition to being responsible for the costs of overseeing the curbside recycling um, component of packaging, that industry is also responsible for contributing towards the management of litter in municipalities and, and provinces. So what they would do, um, well, we haven't seen exactly how it's going to be implemented, but I, the theory of it is that, um, that industry would contribute to the costs of installing bins and maintaining them, so collecting them. So, um, you know, that could, be, that could be a recyclable stream. It could be a, just a complete litter stream. It's, um, we're really pushing towards having industry be responsible for the packaging, regardless of where it ends up. So um, we're, we're certainly keeping a close eye on how that's playing out in other provinces. Um, regarding special events, um, in the um, amendments that we made to S600 earlier this year, there is actually a requirement for special events to submit a litter plan. So, you know, we do have um, a lot of events that um, rely um, on the municipally provided um, bins that are, are in place in the parks and open spaces that they're using. But I mean, that's obviously a, a lot of material to manage when you have an influx of people in that area. So, um, you know, what we would be doing is working with those organizations um, and the event planners to ensure that they have sufficient bins in place to manage all of the material that's on site. Um, that could include also include things like, 
ensuring that you have volunteers or staff in place to sweep the grounds at the end of the day to ensure that there's no litter left behind. So um, that's something that we've, we've definitely contemplated and looked at within S600. Um, presentation for regional council, yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, and uh, the idea around the awards, having a special award for litter, I think that's a great idea as well. And we'd be happy to uh, look at ways that we can we can help support that. Just one quick follow-up comment, if I may. Uh, I was very fortunate to visit Prince Edward Island uh, last weekend. And we all know, from a province perspective, they've got it. They've got it figured out. And so we do have a, a new premier, a new sheriff in town, or a new minister for environment. It'd be great to see this new government in Nova Scotia look at Prince Edward Island and you know see if they can figure it out. I mean, we're a much larger province, but they've got it figured out. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. Shannon, thank you for your work. And so uh, I'll pass it back to everybody else. Thank you, uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Deputy there. Um, just one quick follow-up on that whole um, discussion piece that we've uh, been kicking around about the, uh, the, the can getting overfilled unexpectedly um, and then the, it, 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 it doesn't report. Um, you know, when I've explained that dynamic to residents, most of the time they then say, oh, well, that makes sense. And then they, and they get it. And so I'm wondering, it's just a suggestion for colleagues and maybe for staff as well, um, that, you know, that emphasis on like the, the can, we, the can's emptied on a schedule. We don't know if it ends up filled outside of these is maybe something we want to emphasize in our communication so that residents know, well, it's not just, well, why is that can not emptied? It's like, cause it got filled outside of its usual schedule and making that kind of how we work piece known more clearly so that then people can uh you know call 311 and not be in that mode of like oh, well i can't believe the neglectful municipality isn't isn't emptying the garbage cans so instead they can be oh someone's filled that garbage can up ahead of schedule i better call it in thank you thank you can, can i make a quick point from the chair just, just on uh, enforcement, uh, this, this may be a bit far-fetched, but uh, it seems to me there's a fair bit of litter that gets thrown out of cars. So I, I see citizens using the bins that we're putting uh, in the right places at bus stops and that sort of thing, but, but some, some litter seems to be, uh, the only way it could get where I see it is if it's thrown out of a car window. And I wonder if the, um, the cameras that we're looking at will be uh, if we could have some dialogue with the cameras that are gonna be detecting uh, speed violations, if they could also detect litter violations and, and we'd have the license plates, perhaps we can send out tickets for littering from cars. I don't know if that's doable or not, or if there could be some discussions, Shannon, about the possibility. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so. We are working with our, so our municipal bylaw um, counterparts, as well as our, our um, enforcement um, with HRP and RCMP. So that's certainly something that we can, we can discuss with them. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mr. Chair, did you want to come back or do we move forward with the motion, the vote on the motion or? Hey, Councillor Dale Gammon has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Councillor Dale Gammon. I think sure. it was probably just uh, Tony. It might be my comment that if they're going to be doing monthly data, was that it? That's um, yeah. perhaps, perhaps if that data we could add in the district it comes from, that could be really helpful to councillors, please. Yeah, good point. Thank uh, you. I'll call for the question then, Madam Chair. Okay, question. Uh, do we just do a group vote? I think. Uh, Haruka? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, so there's the next item on the agenda, Madam Chair. We would mind taking that one off. I can put oh, it on certainly. the if you like. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'll put the next item on the floor then, Madam Chair. Uh, this is 12.2.1 plastic pollution resolution. And the motion is that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee recommend regional council to endorse the plastics resolution as outlined in attachment one a uh, request for consideration from da form dated September 2nd. So move to 20. Second, 20 
Well, thank you, Councillor. So this is quite simple. I mean, there really has to be a war on plastics right now. We see what's happening in our environment. And uh, we talked about extended produce responsibility, uh, <laughs> excuse me, just a few moments ago. The government of Canada now uh, plan to ban some single use plastic, uh, like straws and things of that sort, and utensils. That's coming down like many other countries are doing that. Uh, FCM are just asking many uh, municipalities like us, uh, you saw the, uh, the sample uh, that went with the, um, the motion on the resolution. And uh, so they're just asking uh, if we would endorse that. So the way that it works, if we agree, this goes to the regional council saying this community uh, supports the endorsement of this uh, um, resolution. So it's pretty straightforward and uh, anything we can do to have the support of any order of government that's tackling plastic, I think is worthwhile. Thank you. Any for questions the, or comments or? Call for the question. Okay, question. All those in Ma favor? Madam, oh, Madam oh, Chair, oh, Madam sorry. Chair, if I could just yes, interject sir. for a moment. Uh, uh, th through you to the council. Um, uh, the rules state that you are required to have a staff report before you vote, but you can suspend that rule with a two thirds vote. So if you wanted to move straight to a vote, um, you'd have to first move to suspend the rule that requires you to have a staff report. Um, if two thirds vote, in, then you can vote on this motion without a staff report. If not, it's deemed to be adjourned until you have a staff report. Okay. I can speak to that Madam Chair if you like. Uh, always, Thank you. Josh, you know, always ruin things for our fun, you know, with, with doing things properly. Like Thank you, uh, Josh. So, I mean, you know, I don't see the value of a staff report. The staff report, uh, unless there's some concerns or issue of the resolution, it's not coming from uh, just a, any organization, right? So um, it's coming from FCM. So uh, if everyone's in agreement uh, to suspend the uh, the, the rules uh, so that we don't need the staff report and send this to regional council. Uh, I, uh, I put that forward. I don't know if there's any wording, uh, Madam Chair or, or uh, Josh, that we need on that, uh, just to uh, say that that's fine. I would second that. I think uh, I, I totally agree with you, Councillor Vancey. That sounds like a good way forward. Just for the record, we'll just reference section 4.2 of Administrative Order 1. That gives council the power to suspend the rules. Okay. Uh, as stated by the solicitor, then so do we vote twice or the one vote, Josh, encompasses everything? Uh, I think you should vote twice. Okay. Okay, so all those in favor of suspending the regular procedure? Aye. 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 And all those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 So it passes. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for Councilor Morris for stepping in. I'll just finish the meeting very quickly. Thank you. Uh, the 12.3 uh, boards and committees, there's none, there's no motions, there's no in camera, there's no added items. Or, are there any notice? Uh, sorry, is there any items? Items? I should ask that question. We ought to assume that. Seeing none. Uh, are there any notice of motions? Uh, seeing none. At this point in time, there's usually pr uh, public participation. Uh, no one signed up to speak at this time, so we'll, there is no public participation. The next meeting, if required, is October the 7th. So thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, it was another great meeting. Lots of good information. Uh, enjoyed the two presenters. I mean, it looked like there's some follow-up on that. I appreciate every time. So I'm gonna ask someone to ask for an adjournment, motion of adjournment. So moved. So thank you colleagues, uh, have a great day. Uh, be safe out there and uh, uh, pick up any litter you see along the way, that'd be great. Have a good long weekend, everyone. Thank, thank you everybody. Thank you. Hi everybody. Aruka, Bye. Aruka and staff, thank you Aruka and staff, appreciate it.